All right, perfect. Okay, so next chapter here, we're gonna go on the ear. So we have chapter 11 in the terminology book, the ear. I'm gonna share my screen here. And there we go, talk about the ear here. So as we know, um, in dogs, cats, horses, whatever it may be, not so much horses, but um, the dogs and the cats, lots of different shaped ears that we see. Um, they have them sticking up, they have them really long, they have them really short. Um, so lots of different, the outside part of the ear. The inside structure though is gonna be the same, and it's pretty much the same as we do too, as far as hearing, the, the, the pathway that it goes through, um, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll kind of start from there, we'll kind of start from the outside, just like we, whoops, just like we did with the eye. All right, so this is important too, and at the very end, if you keep your paper out, I'm gonna give you a little bit of, um, not necessarily the, the pathway of hearing, it, it will help it, but I'm gonna break it down. There's three parts to the ear. You have your external, you have your middle, and you have your internal. And as, as I've taught this so many times, the ear anatomy, um, people get confused or students get confused as to what is. Everybody knows the external is the ear flap, okay, the pina. That's kind of easy. But once it starts getting to some of the internal things that are in the ear, um, sometimes they get mixed up in, as to what's actually external, middle, and inner. Okay, so we'll, we'll break that down. Um, we'll go through the thing, and then at the very end, I'll do the same little cheat for you. I'll just give you what's in the external, middle, and the inner. So you kind of have it as a cheat sheet. All right, so pinna, you have to remember, you'll hear it pinna, pina. It just depends on who says it. That's just your ear flap. So you're, that's just this fancy name for ear flap. Um, uh, within that external ear is going to be what they call your external auditory canals or your external acoustic metis. Okay, that's your, that's going to be part of your external. And then your tympanic membrane. Your tympanic membrane is just a fancy name for your eardrum. So what, pe what most people think of when they think of eardrum is that's your inner ear. And it's not. It's actually considered part of your external ear, your eardrum. Okay, and again, that pinna or pina comes in different shapes and sizes depending on the species and the breed. Um, if the animal has, and it kind of makes sense, a very erect or standing on its right up like this, pinna, they're going to have a little bit sharper hearing than ones that have the floppy ears. Ones that have floppy ears are also going to be more prone to ear infections because bacteria and all kinds of stuff sticks in there and it stays in there and they're, um, you know, they can develop a lot of infections that way. All right, so the external acoustic metis is long. So when you're, when you're picturing it, and I'll show you on a picture here, it's a very long thing and it's shaped in the animals like an L. So ours as a human, when it, they tell you never to stick a Q-tip in your ear because you're gonna hit your eardrum, it's, it's not impossible, but it's a little harder to hit a dog or a cat's eardrum because their ear sh is shaped like a canal, th or like an L. This question usually shows up on your ABA, the shape of the ear canal. So make sure you remember that, that it's shaped as an L. Um, the L shape actually helps prevent perforation of that eardrum or a puncture of the eardrum by foreign things coming in, especially with those animals with those ears that are, that are erect in the air. Okay, it also corrects, uh, collects what they call cerumen and other secretions within that L. Um, the eardrum itself or the tympanic membrane is a super, super thin connective tissue membrane that attaches across the opening to the middle ear. So if, I always kind of envision it as like a drum, like the very thin part of the drum, that's kind of your ear drum. That's why they call it that, because the sound waves hit that and it makes a vibration and that's kind of what starts off the sound, okay, is your ear drum. So again, that's on the external ear. So perforation is, is that um, stabbing? Yeah, like an opening, like that, like, like picture a drum, because that's your eardrum, and if you took a, a, a knife or a needle or something and just went thunk and made a hole in it, it shouldn't have a hole, because if it has a hole, then they can't hear because there's no vibration. Kind of the same as in a drum. If you stabbed the whole top of it out, you wouldn't hear anything because you couldn't you couldn't have vibration. Same thing. Okay, so the, that, L yeah. so the L shape prevents the stabbing of the eardrum. Right. I mean, it still can happen. Things can still get in the eardrum and perforate it, but normally what perforates or makes the eardrum separate is infection. Infection will get so bad that it'll, it'll actually form a hole in that eardrum. And um, that's when you have, you know, lots of ear infections and stuff like that. All right. So again, this is the external uh, metis or the opening. That's your external ear canal. This is your ear pinna or pinna. That's the outside of the ear. 
Okay, and we'll, we'll get to the inside in a second. All right, so that's your external. Your middle ear, your whole middle ear is housed by a, the tympanic bulla. That's what it's called. So the, everything that's on the inside, we'll talk about a little bit of some of the things that are in the, on the inside here. It's all encased in the tympanic bulla. So you have your external, and now we're in our middle. Within that tympanic bulla are, what, are what's called ossicles or stones. And otic, remember otic means ears. Ossicle means stones or, or bones, um, or not stones, bones, small bones. These are, the, the bones in the ear actually have names. So we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. They're the smallest bones in your whole body. Okay, so that yes, there's actually bones and they all have purposes because when that tympanic membrane gets vibration, it sends all of these in the middle ear off to do certain things. To, it's like a domino effect down into the ear, okay? All the bones are connected by ligaments. So each one of these bones aren't just free, free floating in, the, um, in, that, in that tympanic bulla. They're actually connected. Okay, that first bone that, that when the sound waves get to, that first bone, the malleus, that's attached to the, right in the middle of that tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So as it starts to vibrate, that malleus is going to be, um, to be moved. Okay, it forms that tiny joint within the second bone is the incus, which forms with that third bone, which is the stapes. And then that's in contact with the cochlea, which we haven't talked about yet. Okay, so, so tympanic bulla, inside that tympanic bulla are bones, malleus, inci, incus, and stapes. Okay. If there is a very high or loud sound, we talked um, yesterday about a reflex arc where it, where it kind of bypasses certain to the brain, um, a muscle will contract to limit the movement of the ossicles to prevent injury. Okay, so we talked about the reflex arc, something that, like I said, when it's really dangerous to the body, the body's pretty smart, and it doesn't need permission from the brain to pull it, like when you stick your hand on hot. This is also with a screeching, horrible, loud noise that's gonna damage your eardrum. You're, it'll actually do a reflex arc and miss that one po point so it doesn't have to, so you're, you're actually kind of shut down. It causes hearing loss a little bit, okay? Vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transmitted to the ossicles. Air pressure within that middle ear must be equalized, okay? And it equalizes to the pressure in the air, atmospheric pressure, which makes sense the atmospheric pr pressure, when, it's, when the atmospheric pressure is off, like when you're in an airplane or you're somewhere that's very high, you'll get that popping noise in your ear or the, the hard sound, that's your equilibrium kind of going off in that inner ear, okay? And you don't want that, that, that tympanic membrane will actually swell a little bit. Your eustachian tubes, that's how you say that crazy word there. They link the middle ear to the pharynx. That use, those eustachian tubes have to do with um, balance, okay? So that, that balance and that pressure within those tubes, they all kind of go together. So again, we're still talking about the, the, the middle ear, but that middle ear is connected to the pharynx from eustachian tubes. So that has, and that has a lot to do with balance, which we'll talk about in just a second, because we're gonna get to that inner ear. All right, so a little visual here. So we have our external acoustic meatus. So this is basically opening up that flap and that's what you see on the inside, okay? You have your um, tympanic membrane, which, whoops, let me get my, lost my mouse again. Okay, external and you're going through here and you have your tympanic membrane, which is still part of the external ear, okay? And right here, you're gonna have your tympanic bulla. It doesn't say it on here, but this houses those bones. So external, middle. This is part of your middle ear. Okay, that's going to be your, um, your bones that are the stapes and the ink is there and your malleus is here. That's the first bone it's going to hit and it's going to go down to your stapes, which is going to be your last one. Okay, so that's your visual right there with that. And that's all kind of we talked about right here. So again, this is your tympanic bulla kind of what holds everything in. That's part, all part of your middle. So think of this as out, middle, and then this is your inner ear, which you don't see any of this from the outside of the, the animal at all. All right, so we'll t I'll come back to this picture. 
All right, oh, this is a better picture of the inside of the ear here. So you get your malleus, that's where it first starts, incus stapes. You have a muscle that, and, and all kinds of um, ligaments that hold that in, in there together and muscles that hold those bones in there. And again, this is very small and this is your eardrum right here. So eardrum is where it goes first into your malleus, malleus incus stapes. And again, this is where it holds it. And this is your eustachian tube on its way to the pharynx. All right, so moving on. Again, tympanic bullae are connected to the pharynx or the throat by the eustachian tubes. And each one of these tubes equalizes the pressure and drains that middle ear. So the middle ear needs to drain of fluid. It needs to, you need to keep that, that middle ear part free of fluid and accumulation. Only air should be found in the middle ear. So there should be no kind of fluid in there. Again, atmospheric pressure will affect hearing by putting pressure on the membrane so it can't move. And you, you station tubes help maintain the, the atmospheric pressure. So it's really important that you know the tubes maintain pressure in that. Are we good? I'll move, if you need me to come back to any of these slides when we're done, I will too, because I know some of the stuff I, we talked about in the slide before. All right, so horses, we mostly talk about dogs and cats, but horses have unique tubes um, within, the, within these eustachian tubes. They have two pouches alongside that are all called guttural pouches. pouches. And to, in, in all honesty, no one really knows what purpose they serve, but those pouches a lot of times get diseased. So when we get into module four, we talk more about diseases and horse diseases, and we'll talk about some um, guttural pouches diseases that they see in the horses. All right, so we have external, we have middle, now we have our inner ear. So the inner ear has three parts. We have our cochlea, we have our vestibular apparatus, and we have our semicircular canals. So all of those are within the temporal bone of the ear. So again, you're not seeing any of this part. Even with a scope, you can't see this, the, most of this inner ear. You can see a little bit of it, but it's way down past that bone. You're not even, it's not even on the outside of that ear. So if you kind of feel behind your ear and you feel that bone, all of this inner ear is behind that. All right, so on one side of the temporal bone, um, and this is talking just for on one side, not this side versus this side. This is just one side. There's a small op opening called the oval window. On the other side of the bone, there's a small opening that provides um, a passageway for the nerve. So you can actually hear. So we have our window and we have another opening on the other side. The cochlea actually looks, and we saw it in the other picture, it actually looks like a snail. That's how I remember which one that is. Um, and it's responsible for your actual sense of hearing where your semicircular canals actually, and your um, vestibular actually help with um, balance and head position. So cochlea, that's where your hearing actually comes from. Your semicircular canals actually have to do with balance. They kind of tell your body which way you are. Are you sideways? Are you upside down? Are you going in circles? Um, that's, that's what the, those two responsibilities are. All right, so this is a visual here, just so you have it. There's your snail. That's your cochlea. That's where all your sound is going to be um, made in right in here. Your um, vestibule and your semicircular canals. This all has to do with balance. Kind of crazy. Of course, it's not that big in your ear, but that all has to do with your balance. So again, if there's something wrong in this area here, if anybody's had vertigo, this is kind of where this, this um, stems is right in here in your vestibule, vestibule and your um, semicircular canals. So they both have to they do both with have to do balance? With balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll talk about what balance in just a second. And that's, this is going to answer um, Sam's question too on, on one of the, the thing that she's, the, the worksheet. All right. So inside the cochlea, now we're in the snail. The snail has tubes in it. They're fluid filled. There's three different compartments. Don't worry about the names. The names are in the book. This is, don't worry about the names of it. Just know that the cochlea is filled with fluid. It has different departments. All these departments have different roles on how this fluid goes across the cochlea. Okay, again, we're not worried too much about that. Um, the vestibule part, so we're going down now, contains two fluid filled spaces in the inner ear. They contain patches of sensories, okay, on the floor of it. So again, this has to do with balance. The semicircular canals, they also, they have three fluid filled canals. 
um, each side of the head and they communicate with the vestibule. Okay, so th that's why these two with balance, they kind of communicate with each other. Cochlea, that's got its three compartments. Um, they all have to do with the fluid transmission and then vestibule and semicircle. Those all, one has two, one has three. They have a series of canals, fluid as well. There's a lots of fluid going on in that inner ear. So middle ear should be dry. Lots of fluid things happening on the inner ear. And again, that all has to do with balance. All right, so as far as the auditory pathway, it has to do with sound waves. These sound waves are, are converted to mechanical energy, then to fluid waves, which is what you, you know, in, in the inner ear, and that ultimately it's gonna result with an impulse, a nerve impulse, okay? So sound waves, mechanical energy, fluid waves. And that's what's going to give you what you hear. So the kind of those three things go together. That whole sentence exactly like it is, is in the book exactly like that. It's just worded a little bit different as far as when I say it. So disruption in any of that, as you can imagine, going down that ear um, will cause some form of hearing loss or dizziness or, you know, it, it just depends on what's going on. So again, as far as how it goes, sound waves, pinna is where it's gonna go first, right in your ear. It's gonna go right across the external acutus medius. So that's what you're seeing. When you pick up the flap, that's what you're seeing there. Um, then it's gonna go to that drum, the tympanic membrane. Well, from that drum, it's gonna go to your, your ossicles or your bones and that those bones go in order, okay? They go in a sp specific order, that malleus it hits first, then the incus and the stapes. When it moves past that stapes, that last bone, that's where that oval window is. That's where it's gonna create the fluid. So we got electrical going on here and we have fluid going on here. Okay, that's when it's gonna start entering that fluid wave is gonna go into your, the first duct of that cochlea. Remember I said all those ducts have different things. It's gonna go into that first duct and it's gonna move its way on. And as, that, as it goes on, as that wave goes on through the snail, through those different alleyways, it's gonna send off different nerve sending or nerve things to different parts of that ear to go to the brain. Okay, different types and different interpretation of sound. You're gonna hear different sounds, different pitches, things like that. Okay, the fluid wave will then from there go into uh, um, that, again, that's that a couple more of those um, ducts there. And part of one of those ducts is gonna actually be a shock absorber. It's gonna absorb some of that, that really um, high pitched or a, a really loud noise, it will absorb some of that in there. All right, so this is where, <clears throat> this is gonna answer that equilibrium. So um, equilibrium, as kind of we all know, it's part of your balance. Everybody's got equilibrium, your ears have a lot to do with that. There's two types that you guys need to know, two types, static, dynamic. Okay, and we'll kind of go down from there two types of equilibrium. So as you can imagine, you had two types, you had two things that were in your ear that had to do with balance. That's where this is gonna connect, the static and the dynamic. So each uses th that different portion of that vestibular apparatus. And some of them use the semicircular canal. Okay, lots of different ways that that can get communicated. Some of this with equilibrium is your sense of position, where you're at, um, and I always like to, with equilibrium, I always like to use the example of spinning around in circles for like 30 seconds and then trying to walk a straight line. That's all your fluid in your semicircular canals and your vestibular all going crazy, trying to, trying to right yourself and balance, and you screwed it up because now you're not going in the same direction and then you switch directions. Same thing as when you're going in a car, your body um, as you're driving, you're, all the fluid is coming forward. There's other fluids in those different canals that kind of talk to each other. So you don't feel like your body is moving forward. Otherwise you'd, you'd probably throw up. And that's why people get, and animals get car sickness too. It's just, it's, especially with the young ones, the young puppies, um, some of these things aren't formed correctly in their ears yet um, as they grow. So they, a lot of times they outgrow it. All right, so static equilibrium. This is, this is where it goes on the worksheet here. Relies on two chambers within the vestibule. So static has to do with vestibule. That's your organ for static equilibrium. Okay, so you got those two chambers. Static means staying still. 
Dynamic means moving. So if anybody is in any kind of fitness, anything, when you do static stretches, it means you're, you're just taking your arm, or it doesn't necessarily have to be your arm, and just holding it. That's static. So static is still. Dynamic would be if I wanted to stretch this arm and I'm doing this. That's my dynamic. So dynamic has to do with movement. Static is standing still. So if anybody's had um, vertigo, you know that your body feels like it's moving and it's not because there's a miscommunication in your brain. The equilibrium's off in your inner ear is what's happening with that. Okay. Is that why when you get, is that why when you get dizzy, like, and you see stars, like you feel like your head's spinning? Yep. Yep. It's everything. It's a miscommunication. And, and, and in that, um, stat, cause you're trying to, you're, if you're standing still and you feel everything moving around, it has something to do with your static equilibrium. Something so that's like if, after you get off a cruise ship, like I got land sickness really bad. Yes. I didn't get yes. seasickness. I got land sick. Yes. And part of it is from the, there's cilii that moves in your ear as well. And if it gets, and, this, and there's actually little stones that are in your ear too. And they kind of swish along with that cilii. And if it, and, and there's, there's like a gel that holds those stones and it, it's normal for it to slide. When you're on a ship, it gets used to that sliding position. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm standing still. But, uh, but my, my, my ossicles, my stones are still moving, but your brain all of a sudden is like, yeah, yeah, this is just normal. This is what's happening now because we're on a ship. So all of a sudden you feel better. And then you get on land and you're actually sitting still and your stones are still doing this. Yeah, it was awful. Uh, uh, and, and it will just depend. And it will just depend on how long, you know, sometimes it takes a while for your brain to say, hey, wait a minute. She's not doing that anymore. Ear, stop doing that. Stop moving around like that because you're, you're making her think like she's moving and your vestibule is supposed to make you think like you're standing. So that's where that, that off balance comes. With that with that function there sometimes people will get um, those otoliths will actually get stuck um, and they'll have um, issues that way too so again that all has to do with stones and moving and positions and nerves yeah because sometimes when i lay like if i sit up and then if i lay forward and i'm looking at like green or something i'll i'll like lay and then all of a sudden like i'll get dizzy and i see stars seeing stars and i'm like mm -hmm. well, why is this happening? that's because your your stones <laughs> they're still moving they need to sit still Yep, that's exactly what happens. So this, this um, bullet right here, the otoliths will slide along the gelatinous material as the head changes position. So it's moving to help that neurotransmitter say uh, you're standing still, your, your head is moving, but you're still standing still. So that's kind of what happens there. Kind of, kind of a concept you have to think about. But So the dynamic then, the semicirculars have to do with that. So that's your answer for that second part of the worksheet. So your dynamic equilibrium involves the semicircular canals. And that's based on actual movements of the head. So parts of the canals, that's why it's got three, are oriented in different planes at right angles to each other, um, kind of like this. So it depends on what angle you're at as how your semicircular canals will be working. So at one end of the canals, their sensor, the sensory cells are similar to those in the vestibules for the movement part. Um, so, and whenever the head is turned, the semicircular canal associates with the plane with the movement and around with the fluid. So if you moved your head around and around and around this way, that fluid kind of goes with it around and around and it writes yourself. You're not gonna get too busy, but if you round and round and then stop, if you round and round too much, your semicircular canals are still doing this. So your body still thinks it's going in a circle. So that has to do with that too, the dynamic. All right, neither, neither of those, the static or dynamic alone are enough to main the, maintain balance. They, they need to communicate with each other. Um, part, another thing that comes with that is your input from vision and your body position. So this is the one that has to do with the spinning. So in the book, it even there's a whole long story. You guys can kind of read it. Um, the book gives the example of the spin. If you were to, um, you know, the spin, spin, spin around. If you were to actually look, if somebody was spinning and were to actually be able to look at someone's eyes, their eyes would be doing this because your vision is still trying to, your vision has a lot to do with your balance. So your eyes, and at this term, this is called nystagmus, and you guys need to remember that term. It's just an ocular involuntary rapid rhythmic movement of the eye. It could go this way, it could go this way, it could go all the way around in circles, and that is, again, your eye, your eye movement. Um, 
part of, I always like to use this example too, um, when you have, when you're drinking and you have an alcoholic beverage and it has alcohol in it and that alcohol will interfere with your sight, which then interferes with your balance. And you will, uh, that the, you will also get that nystagmus in your eyes because you're the semicircles. And, and you're actually both of them, your vestibular and your semicircles will be going crazy. And that's what makes that dizzy. That's what makes that dizzy thing. And if you, because I have um, a lot of relatives that are police officers and that's one thing they look for for somebody that's had too much alcohol is that when they, they point something right in front of them, their eyes will not be able to sit still on the finger because your ear, it's involuntary. You can't stop that. So that's called nystagmus. So you have, that's a very important word to remember. Motion sickness, that's an overreaction to sensory input is what motion sickness. So again, that eye with the movement, just an overreaction somewhere in that sensory input is going to make you feel nauseated. And that's what gets um, the animal sick in the car and ourselves too. All right, so there's a lot of things on here. We'll kind of we'll go through them, um, you know, not super, super a lot, but we'll kind of go through some of these diseases. Deafness, because there's so many sections of the ear, it depends on which part of the ear, the auditory pathway that, it, that it's affecting is how the deafness is gonna be, you know, how the animal is gonna be able to hear. We need to determine if it's external, middle, or internal to be able to determine if the animal is actually gonna have um, hearing come back. An otoscope is what we do to examine if it's whether where it's at. And I have a I have a I don't have a cone, but you guys have probably seen this in your doctor's offices where they stick a cone on the end of that, and then they can look right inside of your ear. That cone is as it actually has a light on it, and that cone goes way down in there. And the veterinarian is going to be able to look way into that inner ear, and actually see if the tympanic membrane or eardrum is intact. They're going to be able to see if there's swelling or fluid or anything like that in there. So very important. It's very important when you get animals in with an ear problem that you do not clean the ear. You do not stick anything in that ear until the veterinarian looks and makes sure that that tympanic membrane is intact. Because remember, that's that drum. It's the drum between the middle ear and the inner ear, and there should be no fluid there whatsoever. I'm sorry, the, between the external ear and the uh, middle ear. There should be no fluid in that middle ear. So if there's a puncture in that tympanic membrane, fluid gets in there and it shouldn't be in there. So if you, you go ahead and put ear wash in there, that's gonna be real, that's not gonna be good for the animal's ear. So be very careful, make sure you, they get an exam before you um, put anything in that ear, okay? A lot of times they get wax or cerium in that builds up down there. Sometimes you gotta clean some of that out, but don't clean any of it out until the veterinarian says that you can. Parasites also live in the ear. Um, otodectes, you don't really have to remember that term right now, but those are ear mites um, living and breeding in the ear canals. Super irritating, as you can imagine, if you had little bugs crawling around in your ear canal, um, they hear those bugs. And the first time you see one under a microscope, your ears are gonna itch for probably a good day, because it's pretty gross, because I've actually seen them fighting under the microscope, little, little mites. So otodectes, those are ear mites. Um, animals also with ear mites or ear infections also a lot of times will shake their head a lot and they'll scratch a lot. A lot of times when they shake their head a lot, the pina, I'm gonna grab my little buster here, the pina or the external, this external flap here will actually swell up and, it, and it's called a hematoma. That's what happens is a blood vessel breaks within the cartilage in the ear flap itself or the skin and that'll swell all up with blood because a blood vessel broke and it just keeps bleeding. It's called an oral, oral A-U-R-A-L hematoma. Okay, and that's, that's quite common for animals, especially with big, big floppy ears that get ear infections. Um, many reoccurrent ototitis, so oto means ear, itis is inflammation, externa, that means the external ear, um, involve allergies because they, they're itchy and they shake their head a lot. When a lot of times when they have a reoccurrent um, external otitis, a lot of times that ear canal will actually overgrow and that term hypotrophy or hypertrophy, that is actually a term for overgrowth. So I have a picture of that in the next slide, I believe. So hypertrophy is just overgrowth. And just think of the skin almost like a cauliflower. It just gets so swollen, it gets almost like a scar tissue in there and it, and it, it is really hard for it to heal over. Um, some ear canals, because of that scar tissue and that hypertrophy will actually completely close. And then we're gonna, ha we have to do surgery to open that so that that whole external ear can actually be exposed into that middle ear, okay? 
tympanic bulla disease or that middle ear that those are often a lot of diseases that are really hard to um to treat because again that's underneath that membrane if it, the ear infection gets that far it's a pretty severe ear infection all right so this is an ear hematoma. This is a pretty big one. Um, so as you guys see, the ear flap, and then we have a broken blood vessel, and up between that cartilage and the skin is actually blood. That's actually blood in there, blood and serous fluid um, that are in there. And that, they have to surgically correct that. This is actually an ear hematoma repair. And what they do is if you notice on the middle of that ear, I, I think you guys can see that, it's open. They actually leave a big open hole they, they take almost like a mattress suture. They, they suture the skin right to the cartilage so it, doesn't, so it can't fill up with blood anymore and they leave a hole for it to drain. And that's how they usually fix an ear hematoma. They can pull the blood out so the, so the, the tumor goes down, but it's usually gonna come back because if we can't stop the bleeding on the inside, then it's just gonna keep filling back up. So that's a lot of times where they have to do this repair. This right here is severe height. Um, hypertrophy of the ear, as you see, it kind of looks like cauliflower. That ear is completely closed. They can't hear because that pathway can't go. We, we can't get sound the sound to hit the tympanic membrane to make those waves to send it off to hearing. So a lot of times what we'll have to do is, this is called an ablation or a total ablation surgery. And what they did with this ear is they actually took this part and opened it up. So it's all the way down to that middle part right here. So this is the hole you're seeing and they actually took all the skin off and made it all open. So now the, vi the, the hearing can actually hit over here, okay? But a lot of times the tympanic membrane is removed with that too, so, so there is no sound. So they still can't hear, but it keeps the infection away. Okay, and that's, so would they be more liable to like infection because it's open? Yes, but the infection actually can, it, it, it doesn't sit on the inside because it's all open, but yes, they can get an inner ear infection much easier. Okay. So yeah, this is, and this is last resort. This surgery is pretty painful and it's pretty hard to heal. Um, so this is a last resort. If the ear looked like that, I had, um, we worked with a couple rescue groups that had rescued some breeding chihuahuas from a puppy mill um, that had they probably were never treated for ear infections. So this is what both this dog's ears look like. And he ended up to be deaf, but he was super mean. He was the meanest little chihuahua, but once we did the surgery, it was super nice. I think he was just so painful. Um, yeah. But they did have a lot of extra, um, you know, things that they had to do with this ear and keep it clean and stuff like that. Because yes, they can get infections easier in the inner ear. Okay. All right, yeah. All right, eustachian tubes, those can also be involved in the media, the otitis media, not the internal yet, but the middle part. Um, upper respiratory disease can also um, cause the eustachian tubes to inflame. So anybody that's had a really severe cold, um, sometimes your ears will plug up, maybe you'll get dizzy, and that has to do with your balance, your eustachian tubes. And again, with the horses, you've got those guttural pouches that can abscess um, and, and not cause problems that way. Um, as far as the pupil, um, the, uh, the middle ear and the guttural pouches, sometimes what happens with that, because it's right by um, the sympathetic nervous system, has to do with that as far as the transmission. Um, the animal out actually develop um, different sized pupils because, it, it, again, this is all in the head, so it has to do with nerves going through the head, and that's called anis anisoscoria. That, that crazy word right there, and we'll, we'll get that term more when we go into eyes, you know, into the diseases, but anisoscoria means different size pupils. So that's not normal. When you have a dog come in and you have one pupil that's teeny tiny, and one pupil that's very large, they're gonna think something maybe in the inner ear that's happening or in the nervous system. Um, if the pupil of the affected side, uh, the pupil of the affected side, usually, if you, do, that pupil that's really small or my, meiotic, that's the side usually that the ear has a problem in. That's where the nerve transmission is not getting to where it needs to go um, to, to make that iris, the diaphragm go up and down. Um, all right, so inner ear, that's, the, that's where your, your balance is, your vestibular, your semicircular canals. A lot of times that um, there's a lot of different diseases that can cause that sensory input to go in and out. Ototoxicity, so toxic means poison. Sometimes different medications can actually be toxic to the inner ear. 
So that's why it's really important that you don't put medications or tell clients to put medications in a dog's ear unless we are cats, unless we know that that tympanic membrane is intact. Because some of these medications, if they get to the inner ear, are toxic. So we don't want that to happen. Um, motion sickness, um, sometimes they get what they call vestibular disease. And vestibular disease means in that vestibular apparatus, it gets, there's, it's infected or inflamed and their balance goes off. And sometimes we call that old dog disease because some, it usually, a lot of times it happens in old dogs. It's idiopathic. We don't know why it happens, but the vestibular um, canal, that will actually inflame and it will cause the dog to uh, walk to one side or actually look like it has a stroke. That's usually the symptom that, that presents the, the, the owner will call and say, I think my dog had a stroke. And a lot of times it's the vestibular canals that are um, inflamed that we have to um, use medication for that. So as far as, whoops, as far as motion sickness or that vestibular apparatus, when it gets inflamed, okay, the eustachian tubes, whoops, I'm sorry, go back this way. Um, what happens with that, with, is, as far as that goes, the brain then, it, the nerve impulses that go up to the brain gives you no, nausea feelings. It sends down the signal that you need to get rid of your stom stomach contents. So a lot of times that nausea comes with a, with a balance like that. Um, ataxic, that term in the third bullet. Ataxic or ataxia basically just means walking around with no muscle control. Very, very um, incoordinated. Bumping into walls, walking in circles. So that, that is ataxic. That's an ataxic animal. And that's a lot of times caused from this, um, from this disease here. Nystagmus, when these animals have this, will be present. So again, that's that. The eye, eyeballs making that crazy, crazy motion. That's nystagmus. Um, usually, when they do have this disease, they they recover themselves, but it's supportive treatment. Um, especially, even like you guys, when you're when you're dizzy and you're nauseous, do you want to eat? No, they don't. You don't even want to drink. You don't want to do anything but lay in bed. And that's what happens to these animals. And a lot of times, they need extra support because they're not eating or they're not drinking, so they get dehydrated. So um, extra support for these guys for that. All right, so summary for the eyes and the ears, both. Um, they're both organs of sense. So that's our, part of our sense organs. The eyes allow sight, control the ability to see in the dark and light. The ears allow hearing, and they also have a great deal to do with your equilibrium or balance, that static and dynamic. All right, you ready to write down external, inner, middle? Yeah. Let's write this down so you make sure you got it as a cheat sheet. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right, so let's start with your external ear. So just, you're gonna, you're gonna make these, this isn't necessarily the, the, the hearing pathway, but it's gonna kind of get you from, from the outside of the ear to the inside. So within your external ear is your pinna or your ear flap, P-I-N-N-A. P-I-N-N-A, yeah. And then you're gonna have your external acoustic meatus. And basically that's just your external auditory canal, but it's called a um, acoustic meatus. So would, it, would acoustic meatus be number two or would it still just be under number one with external it's, ear? It's still under external, yeah. It's, yeah, so there's just three things here. So number one, external, pina, external meatus, auditory And is, is the meatus M-E-T? M-E-A-T-U-S, M-E-A-T-U-S, yes. Just like meat, M-E-A-T, M-E-A-T-U-S. Okay. So, so again, that pina is the ear flap, the... The um, meatus is just that L shape. It's that whole L shape as you're looking in the ear. That's your meatus. That's part of your external. Still part of your external is your tympanic membrane or your eardrum. That's all part of your external. So that's number one. Pina, external auditory canal, tympanic membrane slash eardrum. Need to remember that's what it is. Tymp tympanic membrane, you said? Membrane, tympanic membrane, yep. All right, so number two is gonna be your middle, your middle ear. Your whole middle ear is housed by the tympanic bulla. That's your tympanic bulla, B-U-L-L-A, bulla. It's 
I'm sorry. It's spelled Buell. B-U-L-L-A. I'm sorry. That's all right. And within that, within your middle ear, your tympanic bulla is going to be your three bones. Your ossicles. Your malleus, incus, and stapes. And in, as far as the hearing process, they go in that order. Malleus, incus, stapes. These are the bones? Those are the bones. The smallest bones in the body. Yep. Those are inside the middle ear, inside the tympanic bulla. Are all those three bones. So uh, ossicles have the, is one of them? Ossicles just means bones. Okay. So, so then the, you have the mallet or malleus incus, malleus and stapes or stapes i've heard people call it stapes too but it's it should it's stapes is the way you're supposed to say it malleus so, incus, stapes malleus and what's the other two incus i-n-c-u-s incus i-n-c-u-s and then, and then stapes s-t-a-p-e-s -E oh i spelled it right <laughs> <laughs> And Almost still part of that, <laughs> still part of that middle is your eustachian tubes, and that's your eustachian tubes kind of come off that tympanic bulla to connect to your pharynx. So that's still part of the middle. And they connect to what? Uh, the, it connects to the pharynx. So tympanic bulla with your bones, then you have two eustachian tubes, goes right down to your pharynx. Right in here, your pharynx. P H A R N X. That's a weird spelling. P H A R N X. -X. Yep. Pharynx. Uh, y N X. I'm sorry, I missed the Y. I missed the Y. I was, I was like, I had the Y in there. I was like, oh. oh yeah, yeah, I missed the Y. I was writing it too fast. I was writing it too fast. All right, so you got that external middle. So the third one is inner. So these are all in your inner ear. So remember the middle ear should have no fluid. It should be completely dry. Your inner ear has got all kinds of fluid going on in it. So your inner ear is inside your temporal bone. And within that you have your cochlea, C-O-C-H-L-E-A, and that's your snail. That's how you picture that. That's how you remember that one. That's your snail. Gary the snail. <laughs> yeah. And then your, that's where your sense of hearing is going to go. That's where in those canals that it goes within that cochlea, that's where your sense of hearing is going to get back to your brain and tell you that and tell you to hear. So inside that temporal bone is going to be your cochlea or snail. Um, the next two have to do with balance and position. Your vestibular apparatus. And that one has to do with static equilibrium or balance. Staying still. And then the next thing in the inner is the semicircular canals. And that one has to do with your dynamic balance or what your body thinks and how your body reacts when it's moving. So movement? Mo movement, yep. Vestibular apparatus is static equilibrium. Semicircular canals is dynamic equilibrium. Oh, so, okay. So it's, so vestibular is the static and then the semicircular canals. Semicircular is dynamic, dynamic. yep. Dynamic. So in the worksheet, when you get to that one, it's going to ask you which parts of the ear are deal with static and which deal with dynamic. Vestibular static, semicircular dynamic. This is, is all in inner ear. This is all inner. So we have external is just the pina, external audio, auditory canal or the meatus, your, and your tympanic membrane. There should only be three things in your external. That, and tympanic membrane is your eardrum. In your middle ear is gonna be, it's gonna be inside your tympanic bulla, and inside your bulla is gonna be the three bones, the ossicles. Malleus incus stapes. From there is the eustachian tubes that connects to the pharynx. And then you have your inner ear. 
inside of your temporal bone in your skull. You have your cochlea, your vestibular apparatus, and your semicircular canals. And now we don't have to do a poem on both, just one or the other? No, just one, just pick one, whichever one you okay. want. Yeah, okay. or a story or um, you know whatever you wanna do with that. Yeah, it doesn't matter how okay. you do it. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna take this off here. And 